So, uh, Manju uh, has asked me uh, to be very, um, to go slowly in the first three days, but he said that uh, on the last day, uh, you know, the gloves, <laughs> the gloves can be off. So, uh, so I want to tell you of a few, a, a few more advanced topics on cover time and uh, evolving sets and cutoff. We'll see how far we get, but um, let's see. You know, I want to sorry, slideshow. So this is some work done um, done some five years ago with uh, Jian Ding, who at the time was a student in Berkeley and now is just uh, yesterday received tenure in Chicago, and. Uh, and uh, James Lee, who's at the University of Washington, uh, about, about cover time. Um, see, it was done in 2010. It took three years to appear, 2013. And uh, some of the open problems we posed there have uh, just uh, been solved uh, both by Jian and by uh, Alex Jai, who's a student at Stanford. I'll tell you a little bit uh, about that as we go. So, so this is a topic a little different from mixing, but related. It's the topic of cover times. Uh, there are many reasons to be interested in uh, cover time. Um, one of them I mentioned uh, yesterday because cover time corresponds to mixing time in the lamplighter group. But uh, uh, actually computer scientists are quite interested in cover times because uh, they uh, are estimates for a connectivity algorithm. So often you have, uh, you have some network and you want to uh, find out all the vertices in the network and what you can do is run a random walk. And you want to ask how long must you run so that you'll be reasonably sure that you visited all the vertices in the network. And uh, so you want some estimates on the tail of the cover time. So I'll be more precise in a moment. So we're going to look at the random walk on a graph. Uh, and uh, as we've been doing, and look at local times and hitting times. So these are some nice pictures produced by Raisa de Souza. So this is uh, local times <coughs> um, for the random walk run on a large on a large square. I think this is. 500 by 500 square, and uh, we run the random walk for a long time, and the colors record how many times we visited every site. And <laughs> here, uh, on this picture, we ran the random walk for longer, till, and we run this with periodic uh, boundary conditions. So when the, it's really on the torus. When the walk exits here, it re-enters there. So it will eventually cover the whole square. Uh, so again, here, red is the highest number. Um, yeah, and uh, on this one, uh, the yellow ones were the last to be visited. So, uh, so on the right, the colors mean something different. They mean how long it took to reach every vertex. This is the hitting times, the empirical rather than the expected hitting times. Or the, and... Uh, so the cover time is just the maximum of those, hit, of those empirical hitting times. So, so HUV is the expected number of steps to hit V starting from U. And it turns out to be useful to symmetrize this quantity. So KUV is the hitting time from U to V, expected hitting time plus expected hitting time from V to U. So this is obviously a symmetric. Now, the hitting times themselves, they satisfy a triangle inequality. So if I want to hit, uh, you know, the hitting time from U to V is less than the hitting time from U to W plus hitting time from W to V. <coughs> but they're not symmetric. Once we symmetrize, we retain the, the triangle inequality. And uh, so this commute times define a metric. That's, um, that's useful. And 
uh, the cover time is the expected time to hit all vertices. <laughs> um, that may depend on the starting vertex, so we maximize over the starting vertex. And this is just to give you an idea, the orders of magnitude, so without the constants, of uh, cover times of some graphs, right? So for a path, it takes n squared. A, a complete graph is n log n. An expander is also n log n. So these are computer scientists who worked uh, this out in the 80s. And um, so a two-dimensional grid is actually one of the harder graphs to analyze. And uh, up to constant, it was done by uh, Aldous and Zuckerman. Uh, so it's n log squared n. Actually, determining the constant took a lot of work, and that's something I worked on with Amir Dembo, J. Rosen, Ofer Zaytuni. Uh, and the, uh, there's some 4 over pi on the outside. Uh, there's a, and higher dimensional grids turn out to be easier to analyze. So this gives you some idea of different cover times. Why yes. Is, why is this grid so, so because this three-dimensional, the, the infinite three-dimensional grid is transient, then um, you have less dependence. So what is, what is the method that's used to analyze cover times? We'll see, uh, in general, upper bounds are tend to be easier. So one way to prove an upper bound, which is, is to just for each point estimate what's the chance it will take a very long time until it's covered, and just uh, so this and do a union bound over all of these. And this crude method is surprisingly gives you the right answer in many cases. But to prove it gives the right answer, you need a lower bound for the cover time. Lower bounds are hard. How do you prove lower bounds? Well, the naive thing is, we want to show that the cover time is at least t. So let's let take a, uh, at least some threshold. So let's take a t below this threshold. And, we, and then we want to show that at that time it's uncovered. The, the graph is likely to not be covered. So how could we do that? One way is to count the number of points that are not yet covered. This is a random variable. We want to show at this time this variable is likely to be positive. So we can easily compute its expectation but a variable with positive expectation might, or with large expectation, might still be zero with high probability. So then we want some estimate on the variance of this variable. So we want the estimate of the variance on the number of uncovered points. So this involves the dependence between this point and this point being not yet visited. And in two dimensions, there's a lot more correlations between this point being unvisited, there's long range correlation, so it's much harder to analyze the dependence. In fact, the naive approach I just described doesn't work in two dimensions, and one needs to do some more uh, clever truncation, uh, which is quite a, a long story. Um, okay, so <laughs> there are some general bounds. The cover time is, so the complete graph at least up to a factor going to one is the, is the fastest one. So cover time is always at least n log n. Uh, again, this is, with, this, with the sharp constant, this is surprisingly hard to prove. This was a conjecture of Aldous, proved by Ur computer scientist Uri Feige. And, um, Now, a key tool in analyzing uh, hitting times and cover times is the effective resistance between two nodes. So many of you may be familiar with this, but for us, one can there use, there's a relation between commute times and effective resistances which, uh, can, be, which can be used and we can, if you are not familiar with effective resistance, you can think of this as a definition. So the, in any graph, the commute time between u and v is twice the number of edges times the effective resistance between u and v. In particular, the effective resistance defines a metric. So 
hitting times are easy to compute. So H U V remembers the expected hitting time. So from any two distinct vertices U and V, if I want to hit V from U, I first have to take at least one step. <coughs> and, and after that, I have to average over the W's I could reach the hitting time from W to V. So you have this easy identity just by conditioning on the first step. And these identities, you have them for every U and V, and these are linear equations in these quantities H, U, V. And it's easy to see this is a system of, it's a regular system of equations. So the hitting times are just the unique solution of this system of equations. So, so this you can do right, quite fast, less than, uh, less than n cubed operations if n is the number of vertices, and often a lot less because this is often a sparse system of equations. So hitting times are well understood. And one question which was posed by Aldous and Phil in the 90s is, can we compute cover times quickly and deterministically? So quickly, they mean polynomial time in the size of the graph. And this was a hard problem. So they, uh, they didn't expect an exact calculation. But can you even estimate them up to a, up to a reasonable constant deterministically? So if you're willing to randomize, you can just run the random walk many times. Since cover time is at most n cubed, you can um, really uh, run until the cover time and <laughs> average the cover time over many experiments, so you'll get some statistical estimate. <laughs> and they asked, can you uh, describe a deterministic procedure to estimate the cover times? So <laughs> uh, the best estimate before our work was by uh, Jeff Kahn, uh, Kim, uh, Lovas, and Vu. And um, it was up to a log log n factor, log log n squared. But before telling you about that, I have to tell you about the earlier work of Matthews in 88, who related the cover time to the maximal hitting time. So maximal hitting time is certainly less than the cover time. And what Matthews showed is that, the, that this estimate is off by at most a log factor. Um, let's see, I have. Yes. The definition of cover time is that the expected value or the time it takes is it all vertices? That's right. So, for, so it's the maximum over the starting point of the expected time to visit all vertices. Yeah. Okay, so for every starting node, we look at the expected time. It's the maximum of the expectations, not the expected maximum. So. So maximum over the starting point of the expected time to visit all vertices. So you start from the worst place. Yes, you start from the worst, yeah, right. So we want the worst case upper bound. Now, of course, in many examples, if the graph is transitive, then all starting nodes <coughs> are the same. And in general, it, and, OK. So, um, so here's a sketch of the of a proof of, uh, of Matthew's proof, it's, if you haven't seen it, this is a really lovely proof. Um, Matthews was a PhD student of uh, Percy Diaconis when he found this proof in the 80s. Um, so again, the cover time is at most the maximal hitting time multiplied by this series. In fact, you can stop at 1 over n minus 1. Um, and Matthew's proof of this is remarkably short, but really uh, creative. So it's based on a random permut. So he introduces extra randomness in this proof. So we have some randomness coming from the random walk. And Matthews adds additional randomness by saying, let's consider all the vertices, but in a random permutation. J1 to Jn are all the vertices in the graph, but viewed in a random order. How is this going to come in? So denote by tk the first time that all of G, j1 to jk are, are visited. And yk is the state at the time tk. So 
yk is going to be one of j1 to jk, but it's not necessarily jk, because remember, the j's are in random order, independent of the walk. So um, among the vertices j1 to jk are a random permutation, maybe jk is the starting point of the walk. So maybe jk is visited right from the start. So, um, so tk is the first time all of j1 to jk are visited. So it's very possible, in fact, uh, happens frequently that, say, that the tk plus 1 could equal tk, because if, uh, because jk plus 1 could have been visited right at the beginning. So, okay, so yk is the state at time tk. Now we look at the expectation of tk minus tk minus 1 condition on the walk until time tk minus 1 and on these uh, j1 to jk. So, so what is that? It's <coughs> so we will get 0 unless jk is really the last vertex among j1 to jk to be visited. If jk is not the last, then, well, we've already visited it, so we, we, we get 0. So we have this indicator, and so if it is the last, then um, we have to go from yk minus 1 to jk. So now these tau's are, hit, are the random hitting times. Now this expected hitting time, okay, we have all this conditioning, but it doesn't matter. It's just a hitting time from, uh, so I'm actually, so, so here, yeah, so one should still, in the notation here, one should still keep the conditioning. But the point is that we can bound this by the maximal hitting time. So the notation here is, I should keep the conditioning for one more step, but then I could say whatever this quantity is, it's at worst the maximal hitting time. So I can replace this by h max. And then, so really one should re replace the conditional expectation here by h max. Then, because h max is a constant, I can then take expectation of both sides here. And the expectation of this conditional expectation just will give me the expectation of the difference, tk minus tk minus 1. And this is going to be bounded by h max over k, because the probability that yk is jk is exactly 1 over k. This is because we look at the vertices j1 to jk are themselves in a uniform random permutation. So the chance that jk is the last among them to be visited is exactly 1 over k. So really uh, nice proof, especially that it turns out that in many important examples, this bound is sharp. So the Matthews bound is often sharp, though it's often hard to prove that it's sharp. Um, but uh, uh, well, you, you can see in this proof, the extra randomness helps in that this probability, we can say, is exactly 1 over k. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to see when you look at the proof where it helps. But to guess initially that this is what you want to do, that's, uh, that's very creative. Um, <coughs> okay, so in fact, there is a similar lower bound. So the cover time is that we can actually apply a similar argument with a lower bound, but instead of the maximal hitting time, we get the minimal hitting time. So it's really the same argument, you have the minimal hitting time. The problem is the minimal hitting time is typically very short because for neighbors, you typically hit quite quickly. So instead of the minimal hitting time, what the already uh, Matthew still observes is if I take any subs, you know, if a random walk is going to cover the whole graph, it's in particular going to cover any subset. So choose a subset of well-separated points in your graph. And for any such subset, observe that, well, in order to cover, I have to cover this subset. Now, if they're well-separated, then the hitting time from any two, point, any two of these points is going to be quite, um, you know, quite, quite large. And then, so I can choose whatever subset I want. 
and then I take the minimal hitting time within the subset, and then the log factor, which was obtained is really the same way uh, as in the upper bound. So this is the Matthews lower bound, and um, and so to be precise, Matthews lower bound is this together with H max. So H max is also part of the lower bound. So you have you can maximize h max and this quantity. And this gives the Matthews lower bound. And what uh, these authors, KKLV, proved is that when you do the math, so the Matthews upper bound, we said, is sharp up to log n. But it can, the, it can up estimate, overestimate by a factor of log n. Like if you have a, a cycle, the hitting time is order n squared between antipodal points in the cycle. But the cover time is still n squared. So the log n is not needed there at all. Um, so the Matthews <coughs> upper bound can overestimate by a factor of log n. Uh, what they proved is that the Matthews lower bound, which is more sophisticated, involves itself a maximization here. This one can, is only off by a log log n squared. And uh, now, when you look at this maximum, this is a maximum over an exponential collection of sets. So it's not clear that this is something you can compute in polynomial time. But in fact, you can. So there is some dynamic programming algorithm that can compute this maximum recursively very quickly. So this, is, uh, this, was, so this gives an estimate up to log log n squared. Still, the Aldous Phil problem of estimating up to constant was open. What? Right, right. And that's right. Yeah, this is a very, this is a sophisticated proof. So it's not something uh, uh, one can guess, you know, on the spot. This uh, took these. Um, okay. So for uh, the tree is an easy case, and uh, Feige Zituni found an approximation in 09 uh, by recursion on a tree. Now, <laughs> another natural question that motivated research here is in, involves the blanket time. So when you look at the cover time of a graph, even like look at coupon collector, so that's cover time of the complete graph, and at the cover time, you have the last vi vertex to be visited is visited only once, and other vertices are visited much more frequently. So uh, Winkler and Zuckerman asked about the blanket time. So the beta blanket time is the time where all the local times are within factor beta of each other. So uh, the local time is the number of visits to a vertex normalized by its degree because we expect to visit more vertices of high degree, so we normalize by the degree. So asymptotically, all the local times are the same. So the ratio of any two local times will go to one. That's just from basic convergence uh, theory of Markov chains. But Winkler and Zuckerman asked for a more quantitative measure. How long until all these ratios are going to be within beta of each other? And think of beta equals a half or two. Um, so that's a random time, and they ask for the expectation of this time. So this is they call the blanket time. So you have kind of a blanket of about uniform uh, thickness spread over your state space. Now, they could analyze the blanket time only in very few examples, like uh, in the torus and the complete graph. But based on very few examples, they made the courageous guess namely that the blanket time in all graphs is within some universal constant that only depends on beta, not on the graph, of the cover time. And, and this was one of the motivations of KKLV. Jeff Kahn told me they wanted to prove this. And the KKLV argument shows that uh, Winkler and Zuckerman conjecture is true up to a log log n squared factor. Okay, what it turns out is that their conjecture is true, but this uh, was proved later. So in order to 
in order to get the solution both of the Aldous Field conjecture and the Winkler Zuckerman conjecture, we had to employ the Gaussian free field. So let me the Gaussian field is an important Gaussian process, uh, both in the discrete and continuum setting. Here we use it in the discrete setting. And it has uh, many alternative definitions. So one definition is uh, it's a Gaussian process. We normalize it to vanish at some vertex. Um, <coughs> it won't be important, really, which one. And then it's defined by this relation that the variance of the difference in heights of the process at any two points is the effective resistance between those two points. So this characterizes the process. Another characterization is uh, given by the covariance function. So we fix this vertex V0 and consider the random walk killed at V0. So this is, um, right, so this is some finite process. And now I can consider this walk started at X and uh, killed at V0 and measure how many times does it visit y? You count this number of visits, normalized by the degree of y, and that gives you the green kernel corresponding to the skilled random walk. The green kernel is symmetric because we're in a reversible Markov chain and we normalized correctly. And it's positive definite. It also follows from, so, you know, green kernels are always positive definite. So it is the covariance of a Gaussian process and, um, and that Gaussian process is, is exactly the same Gaussian field, and there are several other equivalent defin alternative definitions. These are some pictures of how the field looks just on a square at different resolutions. That formula there does not give you the second moment of G. It, it does, it does, because we assume that G at zero, which, which form? Okay, so, so, so if you just uh, pull. Take, take y to be v naught, yeah. So this applies for all x, y, including v naught. So, so it does give you the second moments, and hence you see that you, it gives you the covariances. Uh, but, okay, it's, it's elementary but not trivial to verify that these two uh, formulations are equivalent. Uh, it's, it's well known, but still, when we wrote this in Annals of Math, the referees asked us to include the explanation of why these two are the same. So, um, so the, our main result is that the cover time is equivalent up to, up to constant to the number of edges in the graph times the expected maximum of the Gaussian free field squared. And this is also equivalent to the blanket time. <coughs> this is, as I said, the result from 2010. We, there are some more recent refinements I'll mention at the end. Um, okay. Yes. Well, first of all, blanket time is always bigger than the cover time, right? Because you have to, so in the cover, you have to visit every vertex at least once. In the blanket, you have to visit all vertices within a fraction beta of each other. Um, so our theorem says that in all graphs, the blanket, if you fix beta, say take beta equals two, then the blanket time is within a universal constant that just depends on beta um, of the cover time. Whether it's regular or irregular. If it's, if it is regular, then the local time that you have The local time is just the number of visits to a vertex. Yes. So then that then are you saying that then the cover time is just depending on the beta that you choose? No. Again. The cover time is defined is defined it doesn't have any beta in the definition, right? The cover time is when we visit all vertices. We're saying that the, bla the, the blanket time, fix a beta like two. So we're saying that the blanket time is not much longer than the cover time. It's just within a constant. So <coughs> at the cover time, the ratio of the local times is huge. But 
you just have to wait a constant multiple of the cover time and all the local times get within a constant of each other. Okay, this is, I think, maybe a bit surprising, but, uh, but that's... And, we do, and I want to emphasize, we don't know kind of a direct probabilistic proof of this. The only proof is by finding an analytic estimate for the cover time and then showing that the same analytic estimate also works for the blanket time. So there is no direct probabilistic uh, link. So, okay, I'll... Uh, so... Um, I won't have time to give you know, the whole background related, but a little bit uh, of this. So this is um, <coughs> conveniently for us, the theory of maximum of Gaussian process has been analyzed extensively before, and uh, so we, can, uh, we could rely on it. So for any Gaussian process, going back to, uh, certainly to Kolmogorov, the question of understanding a maxima was raised and this study was refined. Uh, I'll tell you some high points of that. And one key observation by Dudley is if I have a Gaussian process defined on any uh, index set, the right way to analyze it is to put the metric on the index set which is given by the L2 distance between the Gaussian variables. So even if my space originally had some other metric, just ignore that and use the metric coming from, from the Gaussian process. And the, <laughs> so there are many uh, steps along the way, but the you know, a high point of this theory is the discovery by uh, Fernique in one direction and then Talagrand who completed the proof that the expected maximum of the Gaussian process can be estimated by a deterministic, a complicated but a deterministic quantity based on uh, partitions of the space. Um, I'll tell you uh, later what it is. So in terms of this Talagrand gamma 2, one can write our theorem as the cover time is equivalent to the number of edges times this ga gamma 2. Now, although Talagrand's definition, which I'll tell you later, involved a huge supremum which uh, looks like it needs exponential time to calculate. Uh, again, we could show that there is a recursive algorithm that would compute it in polynomial time. So, so what is gamma 2? I haven't told oh. you yet. But gamma 2 is a deterministic quantity that Talagrand showed is equivalent to the cover time up to, uh, I'm sorry, not the cover time, equivalent to the maximum of the Gaussian process up to a, up to a universal constant. Um, so, but really what, what happened was, uh, to us was something different, that as we were studying cover times um, and looking at the proofs by, uh, by KKLV that I mentioned, it uh, dawned on us that there is an analogy between the study to the study of the maximum of Gaussian process. And once we realized that, then you know, we could rely on that existing theory. And here are just some uh, hints of the connection. So you know, the cover time is at least the maximum hitting time. The, uh, and the analog of that in the Gaussian world is that the expected maximum of the Gaussian process is at least the, uh, expect the maximum over all the individual variables of their uh, um, so the expected maximum squared is, is at least the maximum. So this square is actually should be, um, I'm sorry, the, there should be, they're missing parentheses here. Um, the cover time is, Matthew's upper bound tells you that the cover time is at most the maximum times the log n. And you can also, by a union bound, bound the expected maximum of a Gaussian process by root log n times the maximum variance of the individual variables. So just because you know, the Gaussian tail is e to the minus x squared and the inverse function of that gives you a square root log n. So you get, you know, the standard thing is that if you have n uh, 
Gaussian variables identically distributed, then their maximum is um, at most order root log n. So when you square that, you get the same log n as in Matthew's upper bound. And there's also a classical bound in lower bound in Gaussian process, which is an analog of Matthew's lower bound. And these two bounds existed together for some decades before it was realized that they are analogs of each other. Um, so, <laughs> but really, w uh, for us, the key step was work uh, we did uh, with uh, James, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, Jan Ding, Martin Barlow, Asaf Nachmias, where we were upper bounding the cover time by some, by some integral, which only after the paper was completed, we realized this was an analog of the classical Dudley integral, which estimates the Gaussian process. So once we saw that analogy, we thought, well, then maybe the theory, the analogy extends further to the Fernicta-Lagrand bound. Okay. Um, and there are further analogies like the classical Gaussian concentration bound, so this is the Gaussian tail. In the work of Kan, Kim, Lovas, and Wu, they obtained the concentration bounds for difference of local times which has the same kind of Gaussian tail. So this was another suggestion of the connection. And this is the integral I told you we got in some earlier work, upper bounding the cover time. And it's really a very close analog of the Dudley integral for Gaussian process. I don't have time to go into the details of this, but... Um, and then I mentioned the Talagrand bound. Now, this is Talagrand's definition, which is quite, uh, quite complicated, and I don't, unless you've seen it, this is one of the alternative definitions, not the first one he gave, of this gamma 2 functional. You partition a space uh, x into uh, p as a partition, so p of x is the unique element of a partition containing x. <laughs> then you look at the, determinist, at the sequence of partitions, of size 2 to the 2 to the k, and then you take an infimum over all sequences of partitions. So this is a huge infimum. Once you fix the partition, you take soup over x and x, and then you have this sum, sum 2 to the k over 2, diameter of the set. So, it, uh, so Talagrand has uh, three books where he attempts to explain this and uh, in derived consequences of this kind of bound. And uh, in each one, he takes a different point of view. And of course, these books have a lot more information than, than just these bounds. Uh, but a, a good account focused just on this topic is a book by uh, Marcus and Rosen, which is exactly on Markov process and Gaussian process. Um, and you know, gives a very careful exposition. You want to learn more? Uh, right. Yes. But remember, AK has size 2 to the 2 to the K. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just want to show you there is some concrete definition. If you look at this, it's not at all clear this is computable in polynomial time, but... Uh, uh, so, I'm, go I'm going to skip... So, Nick and Telegram is to uh, use chaining. So, uh, you know, just the union bound over all the points is too crude because uh, the random variables are correlated. So, the idea is you first take points that are well separated, and you bound your process at these uh, separated points. These are these uh, gray points. <coughs> then you look at points that are uh, still reasonably well separated, but for each of these gray points, we look at this uh, you know, a cluster of red points near it. And now, once we've bounded the variable at the gray point, we just have to control these differences between the gray and the red. So we make use of the correlation by saying that the gray point and the red point are close by. So instead of bounding the red point all by itself, we just bound its difference from the gray point. And this difference is small because what these distances represent is the standard deviation of these Gaussian variables. 
And this is just two stages of this tree. In general, you have to continue. So next to these red points, you find more points. So you just have some, build some tree structure on your space. So uh, you know, in Kolmogorov's story, this was just happening in an interval or a, <laughs> or a square. And this was something like a binary partition. Then, uh, Talagro then uh, Dudley took this idea and said, let's take a general metric space and cover, take an optimal covering by epsilon balls and uh, use that to define and reduce epsilon and use that to define the nodes of this approximating tree. And then Fernique Talagran said, well, these epsilon balls that are used to cover, you know, they're a good choice, but they might not be the optimal choice. So let's just optimize over all possible ways to choose this tree, which is what that previous definition is about. And, uh, and at first it looks, well, this, <laughs> this is some crazy optimization, but it still turns out to be useful. And then, you know, the, uh, once you optimize over all these trees, then it turns out to be, to be sharp up to constant. In fact, what uh, Talagrand told me is that, you know, f this was in the 70s, Fernick came up with the idea of this upper bound optimizing over all trees. And, uh, but he was still pessimistic and thought that this would still not be sharp. So he asked Talagrand to find a counterexample showing that this bound is not sharp. Talagrand told me he worked for about a, a year uh, trying to find the counterexample, and uh, he couldn't. And finally he said, well, maybe there isn't. And then in three days he got the proof. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, this is three days after thinking about the problem for a year from the wrong direction. Um, so, uh, you know, final element that we use in the proof is the, and is the part of Dinkin isomorphism theory. So m many of you who've studied Brian motion know the Ray Knight theorem that writes the local time of a Brownian motion as a squared Bessel process. And there is an analog of that in general Markov processes. Um, first discovered by Dinkin, and uh, the most powerful version that we know is due to Eisenbaum, Caspi, Marcus, Rosen, and Xi. And there's an exposition in this book I mentioned of Marcus and Rosen. Um, and what it says is that the, the local time, so we have the, um, so, so really to even state this, you have to give an, okay. So the, this general isomorphism theory is for general Markov process. I won't go into that generality. Um, in the special case of random walks on graphs, um, we're going to have to switch to continuous time. But when you switch to continuous time, it doesn't affect the, it doesn't affect the cover time. So, um, so one can do that. <laughs> and once you switch to continuous time, then LTX is these local times. GX is the Gaussian free field I told you about before. And this is really a special case of this isomorphism theorem, um, which is quite remarkable. So what it says is you take the local time, you add this half gx squared, so g is the Gaussian free field. And this, so this gives you some random field over your graph. So, so the local times and the Gaussian process are independent. Okay, so you just add, add this thing. And this is collection of random variables is equal in loss. So the joint distribution, not just the individual variable, <coughs> the joint distribution is the same as if you take these Gaussian variables subtract root 2L, I'll square, take half, and, um, and look at all the vertices. Now, what is L? So L is a target local time at the vertex V0. So we fix the vertex V0, which we use to define the Gaussian free field. And we wait till we accumulate local time L in that vertex. So that means uh, till our continuous time chain visits that vertex for a total time of L times the degree of V0. So it was for the Gaussian process GX, right? Uh, no. 
So this local time is for the uh, random walk, the continuous time random walk. So it's kind of a strange melange of the random walk and the Gaussian process. But the important thing is on the left you see the local time of the... This is the local time field everywhere. It's kind of normalized to B height L at a specific vertex V0. The Gaussian process is normalized to vanish at that vertex V0. It's independent. So note that you know, the, on the right-hand side, it's a process involving just the Gaussian process, no random walk, and this constant L that we prescribed. On the left-hand side, it's this combination. So, yes. It's a, mm -hmm. So, okay, so this is a quite remarkable, and there is, um, it's been, there's still some mystery surrounding this, uh, because it's, um, the proofs, there are various proofs, but they, most of them involves, you know, take joint Laplace transforms of both sides. <laughs> they can be written as ratios of huge determinants, and that you know, takes some theory to develop, and you show that they are the same. So this is a, a very crude sketch of what you can find in, Marcus and, in the book of Marcus and Rosen. There are now some other proofs as well. So uh, this theory has been used uh, in by Alain Sol Schnittmann in his study of interlacements. So you can find in his uh, relatively new book another um, point of view on this proof. And there are a couple of other proofs, but there's no kind of really um, simple probabilistic explanation of this. So in fact, this is, I'll show this uh, maybe in a minute, what happens <laughs> when, L is, when L is large. So maybe, so, so to emphasize what happens when L is large, that's a natural question. Uh, I just you know, write the big quantities in, uh, in boldface. So, uh, so what happens when, when you make this L very large, then, and you expand the right-hand side, then this L becomes, you know, the dominant term. This is the remainder of the Gaussian correction on the right-hand side, which is lower order. On the left-hand side, this is this uh, variable local time surface, and this is uh, this Gaussian perturbation. Now, the idea is that when you make the local times large enough, these Gaussian perturbations are really going to be lower order, so you'll be able to conclude that the local time field is uniformly positive. In order to prove a lower bound for the blanket time or the, uh, or the cover time, the difficult, which is the difficult part, the lower bound, you need the local times not to vanish. And, and, and for the blanket time, you need the local times to be large enough. Well, the idea is that just by comparing these two sides, since here the right-hand side is a constant with some Gaussian perturbation, the left-hand side is this unknown local time service with the Gaussian perturbation, if the local time is large enough compared to the Gaussian perturbation, then uh, we can conclude that the local time is approximately constant, which is what we need for the blanket time. Um, uh, so the heating... Um, you know, we are in a finite graph, so... It's a different intuition. So I'm, uh, I'm going to skip a lot of the details. You can, uh, again, these papers are, were published and available on the archive. Um, but uh, I want to say that maybe I'll jump to, a, to questions. So I list them in these slides as open questions. But in fact, this has uh, recently been, been solved. So look at the cover time. So we showed that it's equivalent up to constant to the 
number of edges times the square of the expected maximum of the Gaussian free field. So we show this up to a universal constant, but then the question is what can you say about this constant? We had some big bound. From looking at examples, it looked like this constant is, uh, for large graphs, asymptotically one. So there has to be a caveat. So if you're, you know, uh, when you have a Gaussian process and you look at its maximum, it's possible that uh, the maximum is of the same order as individual variables. That's what happens if you take, say, uh, if you take a random walk on a, if you take a Gaussian random walk for n steps, then um, if you look at the maximum, uh, just a standard random walk. So the maximum of the walk is going to be a, uh, order root n, which is the same as the order of the last variable. <coughs> Similarly, remember that on a cycle, the cover time is the same order as the maximal heating time. And the same is true on a path. <coughs> now, this is not an accident. Um, so given a graph, you can ask, is the heating time the same order as the cover time, or are they different? And that turns out to be the same question, is, is the maximum of the Gaussian free field on this graph equivalent to the individual variables, or does it have a larger standard deviation? Um, if they are of the same order, then the cover time is not concentrated. But again, the theorem of Aldo says that if the cover time and the hitting time are different orders, then the cover time as a random variable is concentrated. This is the theorem of Aldo's from um, around 1990. Conversely, there's a Borel concentration and other concentration in Slepian inequality that tell you that for a, um, for the, a Gaussian process, if its maximum is bigger than the, if its maximum has bigger standard deviation than the individual variables, then the maximum is concentrated. And so it's in the latter case we want to focus. So we want, we think of a sequence of graphs where the cover time over the maximal hitting time is going to infinity. So this is not true in the cycle, but it's true in most other graphs you can think of, like in the complete graph, in the torus, and so on. So for such a sequence of graphs, one can expect the ratio here to go to 1. And in the paper with uh, James Lee and Jian Ding, we showed one direction. So we showed the cover time divided by this quantity has a limb soup of at most 1. And we conjectured that this, this is the limit, but we couldn't prove that. Subsequently, Jian Ding showed that under some assumption, this is, this is true. So he showed it if we have a sequence of graphs of fixed bounded degree. Or, and he also showed it in case of trees. And then just uh, last year, Alex Jai, uh, student at Stanford, proved the full conjecture. So this is true in the greatest generality of reversible Markov chains, that as long as the cover time over hitting time goes to infinity, then the ratio of these two sides goes to one. And uh, his proof you know, was based on the ideas I showed you together with one uh, more great idea, which is given the, instead of using the isomorphism theorem on the graph, used it for so-called the cable process. So given a graph, you can always um, think of the edges of the graph as kind of line segments. And instead of running, say, continuous random walk on the graph that jumps discreetly from point to point, you can run a Brownian motion on this one-dimensional complex. So this is a Brownian motion on the uh, line segments connecting vertices, you just run a classical Brownian motion, and when you reach a vertex, yeah, we'll, uh, when you reach a vertex, you just have to kind of choose each excursion where, which of the edges coming out you're going to you go. You, what? And you'll start running or from where you are. Yes. So, this is, uh, this is uh, the Cla the most classical example of this is what's called the Walsh spider. You just have a, a graph, you know, you have a node and k edges sticking out. 
and you want to do brine motion on this object. So all you have to do is decide that each time you reach, so you run a standard brine motion, each time you reach here, you have to decide where to go. And um, this is a little tricky because you reach here, you know, uncountably many times. So, uh, but you can index these by excursions and then uh, just for each excursion, make an independent choice. So if you want to construct this process, you can, <coughs> you know, first run standard Brownian motion and now take each of these excursions, you can order them by size and uh, each excursion assign it a random uh, direction to go. Uh, so anyway, there is a cable pro this is, so if I have any kind of graph, there is this cable process. So I have a general graph, and there's a process that runs Brownian motion here and make, somehow makes the right decision at the corners. And if you examine the local time of this process, so now it's a, con it's a diffusion on this kind of structure, and the local time just corresponds to a local time of the discrete random walk, at, of the discrete space continuous time random walk. And uh, <coughs> Jai's method is to use instead the isomorphism theorem instead of in the discrete set graph as we used it, use it directly for this continuous Gaussian process you get on this. And that, uh, and now the local time is a continuous process and he can use this continuity effectively to, uh, to prove the theorem. So, Each excursion is from zero, and you just have to partition the excursions uh, to the different directions. Okay, um, so, uh, yeah, so just the final thing. So this conjecture was proved. Another thing we didn't know is, can you improve the approximation? So using the Talagrand theory, we um, could estimate the maximum of a Gaussian process up to a constant. But the Talagran theory really loses a constant. It doesn't estimate up to 1 plus epsilon, but um, a ragu Mecca used a different, different ideas to um, estimate the maximum of a Gaussian process directly without using uh, the Talagran theory up to a factor of 1 plus epsilon. So that's uh, work from a couple of years ago. Uh, he is now at UCL. He, he did it, he was a postdoc in Princeton. Now he's a, a faculty at UCLA. So uh, I'll stop here and uh, this second half of today I'll switch to a cutoff. And Ramanujan graphs.